Bible would, turn with me to the book of Exodus this morning, chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3, please. Very often, uh, we're under the impression that we can't do something great for God. Because we're just common. We're common people. We're ordinary. We can't do anything great for God. Uh, we have this false idea that God is not interested in us because, well, we're sinners. We're, we're, we have inabilities. And I say that that's a false idea because if God only used great people, people that were gay, uh, capable of greatness, people that were perfect, people that weren't sinners, He wouldn't have anybody to choose from, would He? But He chooses us because we're what He has and we're what He has to work with. I want you to consider this, moment, uh, this morning Moses. Moses in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is considered... Or, or rather, he's revered as one of the most uh, godliest men to ever live. Yeah, I did a search this week, just just interesting, uh, just to see. Moses appears more times in the Old Testament. Uh, the, actually, the only person in the Old Testament that appears more than, or is mentioned more than Moses, is David. Uh, I think it's about a hundred times more uh, David is mentioned than Moses. But Moses is the man that's referred to quite a bit in the scriptures in the Old Testament. Uh, we think of Moses, or in the New Testament even, Moses is revered in Jesus' day uh, by the Jews as being just the person that they looked up to. He was the lawgiver. Uh, he's actually a recurring person in the uh, New Testament there. Uh, Jesus and uh, James and Peter and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and it was Moses that appeared to them on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when we think of Moses, what do we think of? We think of the burning bush, right? We think of the uh, plagues there in Egypt. We think of the Passover. We think of the parting of the Red Sea. We think of the Ten Commandments. We think of the fiery serpents. And we think of the successful leadership of over 5 million people, uh, men and women, through the wilderness over 40 years in the desert there. That's what we think of. We always think of Moses the leader, we, or Moses the man of God. We never think of Moses the murderer. How many of you, you think of Moses, the first thing you think about, well, he killed that Egyptian. We don't think about that, do we? How many of you, when you think of Moses, you think, well, he's a doubter. He doubted God there whenever God called him and uh, told him that he's going to lead my people out of Egypt. Uh, what about Moses, the, uh, the, this, the disobedient servant, whenever he smote the rock twice and God said, no, you don't do that. Speak to the rock and he smote it again. And, well, did God answer that? Well, sure, water came out, but God punished him for that. We don't think about Moses, the failure. We think about Moses, the man of God. Yet all these things are true about Moses. He was rescued from the Nile by Pharaoh's daughter. He was nursed by his own mother. He was raised in the palace. Uh, he was the heir to the throne of Egypt, as far as we know. But his heart was toward God and toward, God, toward God's people. He was exiled from Egypt for killing an Egyptian when he was 40 years old. And he goes out into the wilderness in the desert... And he meets Zipporah, his wife marries her, and then he takes care of Jethro, her father's sheep, for 40 years. So you do the math. He's 40 years old when he murders a man in Egypt, goes out into the wilderness for 40 years. Whenever we see Moses in Exodus chapter 3, the man is 80 years old. How many of you would like to just get started doing something for God at the age of 80? Uh, no, you know what we're going to say? I'm too old. I can't do anything for God. Hogwash. Yes, you can. God can call Moses whenever he's 80 years old. He can call you and you can do something. It's in the wilderness that we find Moses leading the sheep is where we find ourselves today. We find this, pro, this proud, this strong man, this heir to the throne of Egypt. He's alone. He's, I don't want to say humiliated, but he's humbled. He's been brought down to where he needed to be. He's forgotten about. Where's he at? He's tending his father-in-law's sheep. And it's here in the desert that the unexpected happens. It's here that Moses finds himself, guess what? In the presence of God. He finds himself all alone in the desert in the presence of God. Look with me. Uh, Exodus chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. 
And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, and for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of, ja the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto a place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Egypt, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, then, excuse me, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. I'm glad this morning that God is a God of second chances. Aren't you glad He's a God of second chances? Aren't you glad that He didn't give up on you whenever you were lost and in your sin and deserved nothing more than death and hell for all eternity? Aren't you glad that whenever you trusted Jesus Christ as your, as your Savior, that He forgave you of all your sins? Aren't you glad that the first time that you learned a hard lesson in your Christian life, that, hey, I'm not perfect, I'm not incapable of sin, I'm still in this old flesh, I'm still bound to my sin nature, I'm still capable of sin. Aren't you glad that whenever you were saved, and then you committed that first sin after salvation, and your fellowship was broken, Aren't you glad that God offered you a second chance to stand up and step up and do something for Him? That He made a way for you to be restored to that fellowship? God is a God of second chances. And I'm glad that no matter how sinful, no matter how many mistakes you've made, God is right there with His arms stretched out welcoming you back home to Him. Welcoming you to give you a second chance. I want you to know this morning that if God could use Moses despite his failures to accomplish his purposes and his will, God can use you too. I wonder this morning, do you find yourself in a state of doubt like Moses, a doubt, place of uh, doubt and confusion? Are you, are you like Moses? Are you saying this morning, who, me? Who am I? Me? You want to use me, Lord? Let's pray this morning. Let's look at this passage together. Lord, would you help us this morning? I'd love to be able to preach a great message this morning, Lord, by lots of it just please you. Father, I pray that you'd work in hearts, <coughs> mine especially, God, that you would turn our face towards your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in His name we pray. Amen. As we look at Moses at the burning bush this morning, let's put ourselves in His position. Let's put ourselves in His shoes. Let's ask ourselves, how would I respond if God were calling me? What would I do if this was me? What would I do if I was at this burning bush? Imagine this morning what Moses felt when God appeared in the bush. Verses uh, 1 through 6 in chapter 3. It says this. This is how it starts off. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. This was a day like any other day. This was a day-in, day-out job. You leave the sheep. You get up at the crack of dawn. You take the sheep out. You feed them all day long. And when it gets dark, you bring them back and you put it back in the fold. And you go about your merry, mis your, uh, your, uh, merry business. You go in. You uh, eat your supper. You take your bath. You go to bed. You get up. And guess what? You feed the sheep. You take them out. You uh, flock them out in the desert. This passage Moses up, opens up with Moses doing what he always did. Watching the sheep day in, day out. No changes. Nothing major. Um, no surprises, except there was a surprise. You know why there was a surprise? Because this was a day like no other day. This was a day that God had chosen. Hey Moses, today's the day that I'm going to shake your world upside down. This was a day like none other. God appeared to Moses in the desert, and Moses' life would never be the same. All right, uh, For the last 14,600 days... Did you get that? For 40 years, that's 14,600 days. Moses watched the sheep of Jethro. He kept them safe. But today, everything changed for him. Everything changed for him. Today, God was going to move. God was going to do something out of the ordinary. So you know what God did? He sets a bush on fire 
But he doesn't let it burn. Wow. Now, I spent, I don't know how many years with the fire department. I'm here to tell you, you set a bush on fire, it's going to burn. Unless it's a thorn bush, they never burn. Amen? Oh, anyway, Shane gets me. All right. Now, listen, God sets a bush on fire in the desert. Not a lot of water in the desert. This is a scrub bush. You look at the word for the bush, whatever, and it's, the Hebrew word means a thorny bush. These things were scattered everywhere. This wasn't some new special bush that God specially created for this. This was a, this was a ordinary bush that Moses had seen hundreds of them, thousands of them. No doubt out there in the desert, Moses had been out there and seen a lightning strike hit one of these bushes and it burn up just like that. But here Moses sees this bush burning, but it's not burning up. And Moses says, something ain't right here. Something's different. There's something going on over there, and I want to see what it is. Listen, this bush symbolizes three important facts for us about God. Number one, the bush represented God and His power and His glory. It represented God and His power and His glory. Moses has seen these bushes burn to a crisp in seconds, but this bush refused to burn up. It refused to, be, to burn up. This represents, this rep, or tells us that God's power is unquenchable and His glory is beyond our understanding. Moses couldn't figure out why that bush didn't just burn up. Mo, uh, Moses didn't understand it, so he turns aside to go see what it is. This bush also represented the nation of Israel. Represented the trials and the tribulations that they had endured, but guess what? They weren't wiped out. In the 1940s, 1930s and 40s, Adolf Hitler tried to wipe out the nation of Israel. But guess what? He couldn't do it. You know why? Because God had His hand and He promised He was going to preserve that seed. He was going to preserve those people. God made a promise to Abraham almost 5,000 years ago. And guess what? He's never broken that promise. He's never forgotten that promise. He will never forget that promise. He will never break that promise no matter what anybody tries to do. All right? Uh, we have representatives in the United States House of Representatives today that hate Israel and have made several anti-Semitic comments about them, how they want to sever all ties with them. God help us if we ever have a president that does not have a backbone and severs all ties with Israel because God has promised to bless those that bless them and to curse them that curse them. God help our country because that's the path that we're taking. And if we don't repent and turn our faces back to God, I don't want to be here. So this bush represented the nation of Israel. Notice in verse number 9, uh, verse number 9 here says this, in chapter number 3, God says, I, Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. You see that in verse number 9, God heard the cries of His people, and He had now come to deliver them. Let every child of God rejoice when trials come. James says, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. I think we could all use a little bit more patience. But listen, the reason that we should rejoice is because no matter what the world can throw at you, no matter how hard the devil works against you, we are in the sight of God and He never takes His eyes off of us. He sees us. He hears us. And I'm, getting, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. The bush also represented Moses. He was a humble shepherd, but he was empowered by God. And when he was empowered by God, guess what? He would be unstoppable. The bush was an ordinary thorny bush. They were scattered all throughout the desert. I've already said this. I want you to understand, the bush wasn't God. The bush wasn't God, okay? Uh, it wasn't God was in the bush. God was speaking through the bush. The bush on its own would have just burned up in seconds. But God caused it to burn brighter, to burn hotter, and to not burn up because God was in the bush. For the child of God, in the will of God, let me tell you something, there's nothing you can't accomplish. Amen. When you're saved and you're in the family of God and you're living for Him and His will, and God asks you to do something, He's not asking you to do something impossible. He's asking you to trust Him to accomplish His purpose through you. How about that? God can do whatever He wants to do. He can, he can do it any way He wants to do. But it thrills God to use His people to accomplish His purposes. That ought to humble us. I think it did Moses. 
Listen, I don't pretend to stand here this morning and know what your situation is or to pretend to know what you're dealing with. I don't know your past. I don't know your sin. I don't know your failures. I do know, though, though that God is a God of second chances. I do know this morning that if you're here and you're in need of forgiveness for something, whatever it is, God wants to forgive you. It's His will, His desire for you to be forgiven. And I know that if you're here today in need of help, God wants to help you. I know that if you're here in need of direction, guess what? God wants to guide you. I know that whatever you're facing, I know that it's not bigger than God. I know it's not bigger than God. I know it's nothing that He can't, I know that it's not anything He can't handle. But imagine this morning what Moses felt whenever God appeared to him at that bush. Whenever he turned aside to see this sight, when he entered into the very presence of God on that mountain, whenever, uh, uh, whenever he stepped out of the desert and stepped on the holy ground. Think about that. He stepped on the holy ground out there. He'd been in that desert for the past 40 years, never knew it was holy ground until God called him to it. Imagine what he felt when God appeared at the bush, and then imagine what he felt when God appointed him to the task. Put yourself in his shoes. What if it was you at that bush and God said to you, I want you to go lead my people out. What if it was you at the bush and God said, I want you to start a new Sunday school class. Who's going to be in that class? God says, there's people all out there who need to be in church. And I want you to be their teacher. I want you to be the one to bring them into the church. I want you to be the one to share the gospel with them. I want you to be the one that's going to feed them from the word of God. Look what we see here. God appointed the task to Moses. Was this an impossible task for Moses to do it by himself? Yes, it was. But for God to do it through Moses? No, it wasn't. Guess what God says in verse number 7. Look with me there. Verse number 7, chapter number 3. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. He said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. What a God we have. What a God we serve. What an encouragement it is to know this morning that God sees us. He sees us whenever we're struggling. Whenever you're hurting, God sees it. Whenever uh, you're alone, guess what? God sees you. God's there. Whenever you feel like you don't have any hope in the world, guess what? God sees you. He says, I have heard their cry. I want you to think about that for just a minute. What a great God we have. What a blessing it is to know that God hears us when we call Him. Uh, whenever the whole world shuts you out and you, they won't listen to you, guess what? God hears you. God hears your prayers. Whenever you're all alone and you're crying out for comfort and there's no one there to give you comfort, God hears you. Whenever, whenever you call on Him in your darkest hour, whatever that need is, guess what? God hears it whenever His people call. He said, I know their sorrows. I'm glad today to know that I have a God that knows my sorrows, that knows my pain, that knows my suffering, that knows what I'm dealing with. Whenever there's something that nobody else knows, God knows what it is. Listen, there may be burdens that you carry that nobody else knows about, but God knows what they are. There are scars that you keep hidden from other people around you, but God knows them. And God is there for you. This is my favorite part right here. He says, I... See, I hear, I know, and I am come down to deliver them. I am come down to deliver them. What an amazing God we have. What peace there is in knowing that our God is real, that He sees us, that He hears us, and that He cares for us. He sees your affliction. He hears your cries. He has come down. Listen, He came down to you when you couldn't go up to Him. He met you on your level whenever He sent His Son down here. Moses had no idea about Jesus. He had no idea what God's plan was. He had no idea about the Ten Commandments. He had no clue about anything. Didn't know anything about the tabernacle. Didn't know anything about the temple. Didn't know anything about David or Solomon or anything. Didn't know Paul, Peter, James, John, Judas or anybody. But he knew God. And God said, I am come down to deliver you. And eventually... The uh, fullness of God's plan was to send Himself in the person of Jesus Christ down to this earth to live for us and die for us so that we could trust in Him and live forever with Him and live right here and right now for Him. God sees us, knows us, hears us, and He has come down to deliver us. And if you're a child of God this morning, that ought to excite you. Then Moses goes on and God, Amen. Preach it, sister. <laughs> He goes on and God says this, I will send thee. 
I'm going to send you, Moses. I will send thee. What a humbling thought about our God. He sees our needs, so He knows we struggle. He hears our cries, so He knows how weak we are. He's mighty to save, but He calls us to accomplish His purpose. Think about that for a minute. He calls us to imagine or to accomplish His purpose. Imagine what Moses must have felt when God appeared in that bush before him. Imagine also what he must have felt whenever God called him. God, don't you know I killed a man? God, don't you know I'm a failure? God, don't you know I've been out here in the desert hiding from my sin, hiding from my past, just trying to let you think, you know what? You can run away from your problems, but like my band teacher used to say, everywhere you go, there you are. Imagine also what he must have felt whenever God called him. See, the purpose of the bush was to appoint Moses to be the answer to the prayer of the children of Israel. What's that song Brian Free sing? Uh, Brian Free and Assurance sing? You, know, you might be the answer to somebody's prayer. You ever heard that song? You might be the answer to somebody's prayer this morning. There's somebody out there praying for God to help them, and guess what God's doing? He's lighting a bush somewhere trying to call your attention to Him so that you can be an answer to somebody's prayer. Today, God may be calling you to take His message to some poor old soul. If somebody's never heard the gospel, never heard about God, never heard about His love, never heard about Jesus Christ, never heard about His sacrifice, never heard about their sin, never heard about their need, or how they can find peace at the foot of the cross. And God's calling you to be the one to take that message to them. It's interesting to me that God says to Moses, I am. Moses says, he says, hey, 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 hey. Verse number 13, and he said, and Moses said, Moses said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and I say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name that we should, what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. I am that I am. And he said, Thus, that, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. So God tells Moses, I am. Over and over again, he says, I am. I am come down to deliver them. I am that I am. He uses this phrase, I am, over and over. How God appears in a miraculous way, yet God tells Moses, he says, you are my chosen vessel. You are my chosen vessel to deliver my people and to defeat Pharaoh. God says, I am. Moses says, who am I? Who am I? You know, who are we? We think about that for a minute. Who are we? You know, we're just poor all sinners saved by grace. What, is, what does God really care about us anyway? Well, He cared enough to send His Son to die for us. That's, that's a lot. He cared enough to send uh, someone our way. Not only did He send Jesus to die for us, but you know what else God did? God sent a person your way to share the gospel with you. He sent His Son to die for you. Then He sent a human being, just like you, just like me, a lost sinner, or a sinner saved by grace. He sent them there, the, your way to share the gospel with you. So He didn't do that. I was in church and the preacher was preaching and I fell under conviction and got saved. Well, who sent the preacher? God did. God did. Amen. Thank you. Listen, who am I to tell someone about their sin? This is what we say. Listen, I'm no different. I'm no better than they are. Well, maybe today God's speaking to your heart that you need to surrender, your, surrender yourself to Him completely. Uh, your response is this. Hey, what could God possibly want with me? You respond just like Moses. We tell him all the reasons. This is what Moses did. We're getting to this. Moses gave God a whole list of reasons why I can't be used there. God, there's a whole bunch of reasons here why you should pick somebody else besides me. I like it. I like it whenever we respond like Moses and we tell God the reasons why he shouldn't pick us. Uh, is it really up to us? You ever thought about that? The fact that God's calling, that ought to be enough for us right there. Because guess what? God doesn't make any mistakes. He doesn't make any mistakes. When God calls you, it's because He wants you, okay? It's not up to us. Now, if God does the choosing because... It's not up to us if God does the choosing because God doesn't make mistakes. But imagine how Moses felt whenever God answered his doubts. <laughs> Verse 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? No, that's not important. And not that you're not important, but it's not important as to who you are or who you think you are. What's important is this. It's not who you are. It's who's sending you. That's what's important. It's not who you are. It's who's sending you. God says in verse number 12, He says, I will be with thee. 
Boy, that should have been enough right there. That should have stopped all of Moses' questions, all of his doubts right there. God said, I will be with thee. Can I be honest with you or tell you something this morning? That's still the promise of God to His people today. I will be with thee. God's asking you to do something this morning. Can I tell you something? He's going to be with you every single step of the way. He's not going to ask you to do something and then leave you alone to try to do it on your own power. He's going to be there with you to empower you to do it. Now another doubt. You know, who's sending me, Lord? Who am I going to tell them who is sending me? Verses 13 through 22, we won't read that whole passage, but look at verse number 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, uh, and they shall say unto me, the God of your and I shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, that they shall say unto me, What is his name? That, uh, what shall I say unto them? He said, who's, saying, who's sending me, Lord? Moses knew that the Jews would need assurance that God sent him. And so he says, Who's sending me? God says, Who's sending you? I am. I am that I am, am sending you. That's who's sending you. At this we see God explaining to Moses and to Israel and to us the meaning of His name. They had known His name for years. It's Yahweh. We pronounce it Jehovah. A better interpretation is Yahweh. And it means the I am. The ever existing one. You know what this name means? It means I was, I am, and I will be. That's what the name means. I am always his plan will be accomplished. Moses, I am sending you. Go do your job. Maybe God's calling you today. You're dragging your feet, putting your heels down. Hey, if the I am is calling you, you better get going. They won't believe me, Moses says. Hey, we're all the way in chapter 4 this morning. You didn't know we was going to cover two chapters, did you? We're already, already in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We won't look at all those. But if you want to look back at chapter 3 and verse number 18. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has, has met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey to the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Who is sending me? Or they won't believe me, is what, is what Moses said. They won't believe me. Verse number 4, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Well, we back up to verse number 18, and God, God says, And they shall hearken to thy voice. Moses says, They won't hearken to me, and God's already answered that question. You know what our problem is in churches? We're asking questions that God's already answered. That's what's wrong with churches today. That's the reason they're not getting anything accomplished. Because they're asking questions that God's already answered. They're wasting their time. God literally just said, They shall hearken to thy voice. In other words, Moses, they will believe you because I am sending you. And if the promise of God wasn't enough, how about the power of God? What? You don't think they'll believe your words? Well, they'll believe my miracles. Take that rod, cast it down. It becomes a snake. I'd have been off that mountain. But it became a snake, and God said, pick it up, and he picked it up. Now, if God takes, tells me to pick up a snake, it better that request better come with a certified letter from heaven. Amen. Because I don't like snakes. But anyways, Moses reached down and picked it up, and God said, take your hand and draw it to your breast. And when he did, his hand became leprous, and he panicked because that's an incurable disease. And God said, now stretch it out again, and it became whole. God said, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you miracles to accomplish things. Anyway, he said this. He says, Moses, I'm going to do all these things, and I'm going to let you perform miracles there in Egypt, and I'm going to let, I'm going to let them see you do a mighty, I'm going to let them see me do a mighty work through you. And lastly, Moses gives another excuse. He says, I'm not an eloquent speaker. In other words, I can't talk good, Lord. That's what he says. I can't talk good. I'm not a good speaker. You know, the Bible tells us early on in Moses' life that he was a man of powerful words. But then we see him here in the desert 40 years later, 80 years later. Guess what? He's forgotten how to speak. He's lost all confidence in himself. When we first meet Moses there, where he rises up and kills that Egyptian, that's a man that is very sure of himself. He's like a horse charging before, charging ahead of God. But now we see a man right here now, he's more like a mule digging his feet in, being drugged behind the will of God. He says, Lord, I can't speak well. You know how God answered that? He said, who made man's mouth? I did. I'll put the words in your mouth. Moses made excuses why God couldn't use him. My pastor used to say this. He used to say that an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. I want you to know something. God didn't call Moses because he was a gifted man or because he was a credible witness 
or because he was famous or because he was perfect or for any other reason for that matter, the only ability that God was interested in was availability. The only thing that God was interested in is somebody that would just stand up and uh, step into the gap. Sometimes God must remove all of our excuses as to why He should call somebody else before we can realize, hey, I'm the one He wants. God isn't looking for somebody this morning with talent, with, with beauty, with affluence, with money, with fame, or for any other trait that we find in our shallow world to be important. And let's be honest, in our world it's very shallow. Who do we look up to? We look up to the people with money. We look up to the people with prestige. We look up to the people that have talent. We look up to those people, but God's not looking for those people. Do you know what God is looking for? Let me tell you what He's looking for. He's looking for some bushes that He can burn. That's what He's looking for. He's looking for people that will be willing to be used. Empty vessels willing to be used. He's looking for bushes. Unassuming, ordinary, commonplace bushes that He can use for His glory. He's looking for bushes that are willing to be set on fire for Him. Let me tell you, God is looking for you. God is looking for you just to step up and say, God, I don't have a lot, but what I've got is yours. God, I'm not much, but I'm yours. Let me ask you, will you be found willing? Will you be found ready? Will you be found worthy to be used of God? Let me leave you with this thought. To be willing, you must be surrendered. You must be surrendered. Willing to let God into every single corner of your life without holding anything back. You know what we do sometimes? You ever have people over and there's only certain rooms you want them going in? Amen. It's not just us then. We have two and a half bathrooms. And usually when we have guests there, we just use the back hallway bathroom. We don't use it as often. It's usually cleaner. you got to be willing to let God into every room of your house. You say, well, i got that one closet that's got all kinds of junk in it. How about you clean the junk out of your closet? Speaking spiritually. Spiritually speaking. you got to be fully surrendered. To be ready, you must be prepared. Prepared to do whatever is asked of you. You must be prayed up and read up. You must be willing to stand up and to speak up no matter what. When God asks you, you've got to be ready. You've got to be willing and you've got to be ready. To be worthy, you must be in the family. To be worthy to be used to God, you must be in the family. Ask yourself, if today was my last day on earth, am I 100% certain that I'd be in heaven? 100% certain. <coughs> There's no doubts in my mind. There's no curiosity. There's no worry that if I died today, I'd be in heaven. If the answer is yes, then well, praise the Lord. But if the answer is no, then ask yourself, what am I waiting on? What am I waiting for? Maybe there's a bush in your life. Maybe this message was a bush in your life to get your attention and make you realize that you're in the presence of God this morning. Hey, you're in the presence of God everywhere you go. You just don't realize it. If God's speaking to your heart this morning, saying to you, listen, you know, there's sin in your life. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. And that sin's holding you away from God. That's the only thing coming between you. By the way, that is the only thing coming between you and the Lord is your unwillingness to ask God to forgive you and ask Him to save you. That's the only thing stopping you from being a child of God. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're a child of God. You know that. But there's still something in your life that you're holding on to that you're not willing to let go of. Hey, God knows what it is already. Once you go ahead and confess it to Him. When you confess it to God, you're just saying, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. And I want to do something about that this morning. Let's bow our heads. We'll just sit where we're at. No, no music this morning. Listen, God's a God of second chances. And I don't care who you are or what you've done. God loves you and God wants you to be part of His family. If you're part of the family God, of God this morning, you know you're saved and on your way to heaven. Just raise your hand this morning. God bless you. Amen. Appreciate that. Appreciate those hands going up. That's about 100% participation this morning. So we appreciate that. Let me just say something this morning. If you're here this morning and you raise your hand that you're a child of God, but there's something in your life, you're not fully surrendered, you're not fully willing, you're not ready to serve Him in a moment's notice, can I tell you something? You need to take care of that. Because that's a dangerous place to be, to be part of the family of God and have that lack of fellowship with Him. Would you pray for that? Would you ask God to forgive you this morning? If you're here this morning and you don't know that you're saved, you don't know that you're a child of God, listen, I won't put you on the spot. I won't embarrass you. I won't call your name. But if you would, just raise your hand and say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm not sure that I'm a child of God. I'd like, to, I'd like for you to pray for me. May every heart clear this morning. Let's pray and we'll go to the house.
Father, we do thank you this morning. We do praise your holy name for what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do. God, I want to pray that you would bring everybody here. And I believe that there's a burning bush experience for every person that's a child of God. I believe it's not enough just to be saved, God. That's enough to get you into heaven. That's enough to have your sins forgiven and become part of the family, Lord. But I believe for every child of God, there's a burning bush in our life, a turning point where we have all of our excuses answered. Whenever we get in the presence of God and you're calling us to do something, Lord, I don't believe that you call every single person to preach. I don't believe you call every person to the full-time ministry, God, but I believe that you're calling every single child of God to be a full-time minister to someone, somewhere, somehow. Whether it's within the local church or whether it's just on your job or whatever it is, wherever you go, God, we are, we are supposed to be ministers. Father, I pray this morning that whoever might be here that might be struggling with this calling on their life, God, that you would just encourage them. Give them the courage to step out on faith and to take that call seriously. Father, I pray that you would bless our church, increase our number. we got several people this morning that are sick and um, just not feeling well. We just pray for them this morning. Lift them up to you, God. <coughs> Father in heaven, we ask that you would bless us as we go about this afternoon. We go about our, our separate ways, Lord, that you would just encourage us, Lord, to call upon your name even in public. Lord, let others know that we're Christians and that we love our Lord and that He died for us and He loves them too, God. Help us to be a witness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.